Hey folks, this is Dan Abbott. I teach at Southern Maine Community College. This is lesson two in the CAD management class, AEDD 260. And this one is about puzzlers, things that happen in AutoCAD that have puzzled people over the years and for which there is a solution. These are not problems with the software or glitches. They're things that people run into in the normal operation of AutoCAD that cause them to be confused. All of these came from questions I was asked by companies or people who work for companies in the field. These are not questions from students. Students often have questions about things that puzzle them because they're just not experienced yet. But the kinds of things we're about to talk about are the things that puzzle people who are working with the software, and in many cases, people who have worked with the software for some time. So I'm going to switch over to AutoCAD, and then I'm going to go through 24 of these. When I'm done, you will then have the responsibility for reading the chapter in our book and the chapter in our book is AutoCAD Secrets Every User Should Know and I'm going to give you as an assignment a series of puzzlers that you will solve document your solution and then submit the work that you did to um, to fix the problems. Uh, there's the cover of your book AutoCAD Secrets Every User Should Know. The puzzler chapter is chapter 11 the last chapter in the book and it starts right about here. It's a little 3D from the last chapter. Here we go. So it starts here and explains where these things came from. In the book you have a series of these presented and then at the end of that chapter there's a solutions for each one of them. Many of them are the ones I'm going through today. There are others that are not. And some of the puzzles I'm going to give you, I'm hoping that you will be able to solve, not because there's a specific solution in your book or in this presentation, but that the process of watching these things get solved will give you an indication of the way to approach the solution of other problems you might run into. So we'll start with AutoCAD. I'm going to start a brand new drawing. And I'll go through and I'll set up each one of these problems. What I've done here just a word about what I have uh, as far as the uh, setup in AutoCAD goes. I have my command line at the top. I've been doing that for ever since I started presenting with AutoCAD because it, if, ever since I've been able to move the command line to the top. Because what that allows people to do who are watching on an overhead projection screen and sitting in a classroom is to be able to see the command line more effectively. In this course, because we're going to be moving from this unit into units involving customizing with the ACAD PGP file where you're going to be creating aliases for commands and external commands which is a really powerful tool that gets very very little use in the field but should get more. We're going to be dealing with scripts and they're going to be dealing with auto list programming. You need to understand the command structure of AutoCAD in order to do those things. I'm going to concentrate for this process on the command line as opposed to the ribbon which as you notice I've closed up. That's there if I need it. <clears throat> the one thing on the ribbon that I just can't live without is the layer command and the layer commands and the drop down that allows you to make some changes to the layers. So that I have as a toolbar, but other than that, I'm going to use only the command prompt. I have the background set to a gray color because students have told me in the past that they find that easier to look at, even online, than the white background that I normally use. And the black background I think is hard to, to see sometimes as well, see the contrast with the things you're drawing. I have uh, palettes over here, a layer palette, properties palette, design center, and external references. That's what I normally keep um, open. On the other side, I've got the tool palette, and there's nothing there right now. I don't have any tools set up yet, um, but it's there. We won't be looking at that today, but we'll be spending some time with that later on in the semester. I normally have uh, the insert palette over there as well. But this is what happens now when I try to put the insert palette in. This is uh, something that was happening when I first installed AutoCAD. So we'll start with this as a new puzzler, brand new puzzler. There's something about that palette that is causing a problem, probably with my video card, but it's not clear. The solution for that is to go and edit the registry. Um, I'm going to just show you how to get into the registry, and then I'm going to pause this and see if I can't fix the problem for now. But I would suggest that you probably want to be very cautious about registry editing unless you uh, really know what you're doing. And I'm going to type regedit in the search window in Windows. 
registry editor pops up and asks me if I really mean it. And the registry editor looks like this, and it contains all kinds of really important tools and settings and programs, files that manage the way your software works. I'm going to pause, and then I'll be back. And I'm back. So I've solved the unhandled exception error several times, and that means that it worked for a while and then it stopped working. I think I've now permanently solved it, and I'm going to show you the things I went through to do it because this is another example of puzzlers. It's pretty clear that I'm not the only person that has had this problem. Of course, I went and Googled it, and I uh, actually initially I went and tried changing the, uh, the system registry because I had solved this problem once before by going and finding a key in the registry file that referred to block libraries and I deleted it and things the problem went away. The problem clearly is the new block palette but it has to do more with um, the net framework for Microsoft that gets installed automatically with AutoCAD and it actually came up again after a long time of not being a problem once I attempted well once I reinstalled the uh, Visual Studio Code that Autodesk has made as an alternative editing environment for Autolisp. We'll look at that a little later on, but when you do Autolisp, there's an editing um, environment called VLisp, actually called VLide, but VLisp is an alias for it. That opens up a text editor that is a really nice little tool for creating and troubleshooting Autolisp programs. This, some, this uh, release for the first time, they allowed as an alternative the use of the Microsoft Visual Studio Code. And when I downloaded that, that's when the problem started happening. So the, the point here is that a lot of people have had problems with AutoCAD along these lines, and it apparently has to do with that net framework. I um, finally uninstalled AutoCAD completely and then reinstalled it after trying just to do a repair. That worked once, and then the next time I started AutoCAD, I got the error back again. What I finally did was I went to the... Um, a tool that gets installed with AutoCAD which is just called Restalled, uh, Restore Defaults. That tool uh, you find by going to the Start menu, going and finding the AutoCAD folder, AutoCAD 2021, and the tool that comes up is called Reset Settings to Default. That's what I finally did. This is after doing a clean install, by the way, and, and, do, and changing nothing else. So what I've done now is done the reinstall, I've restored the defaults, and now when I type I for insert, I get the insert palette, the insert block palette as opposed to the error message. That's worked several times going back and forth. We'll see. I'm going to use AutoCAD to finish up this presentation, and we'll see if it pops up again. It happens. That's just the way it is. Sometimes it happens. Okay. Let's um, get started with the, uh, the puzzlers. First puzzler is this one. This actually started in 2007 when Autodesk made a significant change in the way coordinate entry worked with AutoCAD. Normally, if I want to draw a circle someplace and I want to put it at a specific location like 5, 5, I type 5, 5 and it goes to that location. You can see that it did that. And then I indicate what the size of the radius is, or I type D for diameter, and this indicate what size the diameter is going to be. I'll make that 2. That means that the last point I entered was the center of that circle. Which means that now if I were to say, let's draw a line starting from the center of that circle. I'll type the at symbol for that. That's the last point entered. And then let's say I wanted to go over here 10 units. And then I want to go back to an absolute coordinate location. Let's come back down here. So right now I want to go back to 5, 5. So I type 5, 5 again. First, as I start typing, it kind of does this weird display thing. But if I look over here in Dynamic Input, 5, 5, I press Enter. And instead of going to the location I just typed, the 5, 5 location, it went to the right and up. And if I were to measure that, I would discover that it went to the right and up 5 units. 5, 5 is an absolute location is right back here where the center of that circle is. If then I decide, well, let me draw that line and go to the 0, 0 location, which is back where the icon is. If I type 0, 0, press Enter, nothing appears to happen. 
what actually happened was that I drew a line and I drew a line that had a zero length because what Autodesk did in 2007 is they changed coordinate entry so that if you're using dynamic input and I have dynamic input turned on and that is the default if you're using dynamic input typing a coordinate rather than be an absolute coordinate is now always relative because they decided that's what most people were going to do when they typed in coordinates. So you don't type the at symbol, you just type the coordinate value you want and it acts as a relative coordinate. In this case, starting here, it went over 5 and up 5. However, when I tried to go back to 0, 0, what it did instead was drew a line there and it drew a line there that started at the end of that line and ended at the end of that line. If I put a window around this, you notice that it selects something. If I do a list on it, it tells me I have a line and that the length of the line is zero. Well, zero length line is a pain in the neck for a number of reasons, and one of them is that if it's located someplace where there are no other lines, it still has an endpoint. In fact, in theory, it has two endpoints that are identical. So the question is, what happened? What happened was they decided that it was a more efficient way for people to draw. Now, if you were to turn off dynamic input, which is what I always do, first you have to go and find the switch for turning it on and off. The switch for turning off dynamic input should be down here in the status line. It isn't by default. I have to go and turn the switch on that I can then use to turn dynamic input off. I can also do it at the command line. But these status bar icons are so useful, I want to make sure you understand that you have control over their visibility. If I go over here to the customization button that has three horizontal lines, and I come up here, there are some things I never use, the grid, Snap mode on occasion, but I'll just turn that off when I want to use it. I don't ever use ortho mode ever anymore because we don't have to with tracking. Polar tracking I absolutely use. Isometric drafting, unless I'm doing a piping schematic, I wouldn't be using. Object snap tracking I want. 2D object snap I clearly want. I want to be able to turn line weights on and off, so I'm going to turn that switch on. And I'm going to go back and turn on the switch for dynamic input because I'd like to be able to turn it off. So it's like walking into a room and wanting to turn the lights on and off, but the switch to do that is not visible to you. And then discovering that you have to lift a curtain to go find that switch. We've just lifted the curtain on some switches and covered up others. So I come back out, now I can turn dynamic input off. Now the other thing you'll notice is I don't have a command line at all, because I also made it possible at the same time to have the command line itself turned off. Now by default it's a floating command line. And if I were to type command line someplace, I can't see anything now because I've turned dynamic input off. So I want my command line on, and so I would set it to be on, turn off dynamic input and leave it that way. You also notice I put my command line at the top of the um, screen, and I do that because when I'm teaching and doing workshops, I'm usually at an overhead projector and having the command line at the top is easier for the people in the audience or the class to read. I've also changed the font so it's thicker and taller and a different font that is easier to read. And you can tell I've changed the background color as well to a color that most of my students have said is the easiest on the eyes when I'm teaching, even when I'm teaching online. I've also got some tool palettes that are just um, docked over here. I've got the layer palette, so I just hover over it got the design center palette, I've got the properties palette, and normally I also have the external references palette. And in order to dock it, I turn it on, go to the little icon for tools, and then I say anchor left, and then it anchors left. So now I have the external references palette as well. On the right, I normally have the tool palette, which is where I have right now. This is the default tool palette since I just installed the software again. And I have the Blocks tool palette now in the release 2021 um, because that's the way that the, the insert command works. And so I want to make sure that I, I can use it. I'm not fond of it, I will say. I prefer the classic insert. And this is what's caused my problem with the unhandled error exception. Unhandled exception, I mean. So that's the way I've got this set up right now. Now, going back to having the command line on and having dynamic input turned off, if I draw a line now, and I say I want to go from here to here to here, if I were to type 5 comma 5, which is the center of that circle now, that's an absolute coordinate now. So what's the difference? Well, in this situation, if you want absolute coordinates, now I'm going back now to the situation which happens by default. If I wanted to go from here to the center of that circle, which is 5 comma 5, 
I'd have to type a pound sign and then five comma five in order for that entry to be absolute and not relative. The zero zero is the one that causes some problems because people are frequently trying to move things. Like suppose I wanted to move that circle so that the center went to zero comma zero. I do that and it stays put. If I were to try copying it, it would actually give me a duplicate copy on top of the old one. Now, if you like dynamic input, I do not, but if you do, and I find, by the way, that most people who are serious users don't use it, but a lot of people do like it, and if you like it, that's fine. But if you want dynamic input, you either have to make sure that when you do absolute and relative coordinates, you recognize that absolute require the pound sign and relative is the default. If you don't like that, you can do is set a variable called dyn dynamic ip input coords coordinates and if you set that to one now it'll behave the way that dynamic imp uh, the way that coordinate entry has always worked personally i'm going to go like this no dynamic input i'm going to have that turned off i'm going to have a command line i'm going to use that command line and i don't use a floating command line because i prefer to have it fixed again that's that's really up to you that's your call Puzzle number two, um, we're going to go to options for this one. So we open up the options dialog box and we look under files because we want to go and find an autosave file. AutoCAD's autosave files have an SV dollar sign extension. They are, they are stored by default in a specific location. And if you come down here and look for autosave file location and open it up, you'll see that it's in C colon backslash users backslash Dan backslash app data. Dan is my login name, so that's going to be your name or your login name there. App data is a folder, application data. And then local versus roaming, this is the location, is another folder. And then there's a temporary folder, and that temporary folder is significant because what it tells you is that the autosave files in AutoCAD are temporary files, which is what the SV dollar sign extension stands for. So if you see a file name and it has an SV dollar sign as an extension, the dollar sign means that it's a temporary file. What Autodesk, what AutoCAD does is every 10 minutes, that's the default setting, every 10 minutes it'll do an autosave and save a file in that temporary location with that extension that is whatever your current drawing status is at that time. It does that and then deletes that file if you leave AutoCAD normally. It will not delete it if something happens, if it crashes, if you get an unhandled error as well, like I did, and then it won't work anymore. If you just turn off or cancel AutoCAD or turn your computer off or anything that's abnormal. Now, there is a file recovery um, option now that comes up automatically, theoretically, when you start AutoCAD again, but it doesn't always come up. So what happens when you really want to know if there's a, a save file that you can go back to? Before I get and show you what the problem is with that, I would say that it makes a lot of sense for you to put a different location than the one Autodesk has. So let's go and see why that's a problem. Um, and just to make sure that I go to the right place, I'm going to start by just copying that file location, that path. So I've got that path now in my clipboard, and I'll show you in a minute why I did that. I'm going to go to Windows uh, File Explorer. And in Windows File Explorer, I'm going to go and look for that folder. So to look for that folder, I'm going to go to the C drive, which is where it said it was. I'm going to go down to Users, which is a list of all the people who have logins on this computer. I'm going to go to D Dan, which is my login. I'm going to go to App Data. The problem is it's not there. It's weird because it said it was there, but I don't see it there. If I were to paste that path in Windows Explorer and then press enter, lo and behold, it exists. We got there. And this is where autosave files are saved. Autosave files have an SV dollar sign extension, but also by default in Windows, I don't see these extensions, so I really can't tell where my autosave files are, and it's important that I be able to find the extension because in order to turn an autosave file into a drawing file, I need to change or add a DWG extension to the end of that file. So the first problem, why couldn't we see this when we were back here in Dan and app data wasn't showing? Because the app data folder is a hidden folder. By default, Windows doesn't display hidden folders. Why anyone at Autodesk decided to put an important file there that you might want to find someday is beyond me, but that's what they did. 
What you have to do if you want to see hidden folders, and I recommend if you're going to be serious about managing software that you do this, is you go up to the tabs at the top, you go to the View tab, go over to Options, and then Change Folder and Search Options. And when you come up with that dialog box, you go to the Search, I'm sorry, the View tab, and then down here, instead of Don't Show Hidden Files and Folders, say Show Hidden Files and Folders. Well, there's one other thing here as well. By default, Windows hides any extension for any file type that is known, which means you can't change it no matter what you do. And even if you try adding an extension, it won't add it to it because the extension that was already there will be the file extension. So I'm going to clear that checkbox. And now you'll notice app data shows up. It's slightly grayed out or slightly faded. That's because it's a hidden folder. But now I can go in there, go to the local, go to um, temp, which is right down here. Now if I go down and take a look at these, You'll notice if I get down to the files, now the extensions themselves are being shown. DWG extension is being shown here. And, but not those. Why not? Let me go find out. I'm going to go back to options. Actually, maybe because I need to get out and back in. I'm going to try that. So, once again, I'm going to go to the C drive. I'm going to go to users. I'm going to go to my username, happens to be Dan in this case. I'm going to go to the app data folder, which is showing. I'm going to go to local, temp, and I'm going to see if I can find file extensions. DWG is there, DWG is, and I finally found one. Uh, so there's one right here. The drawing number that's added is a sort of randomly added number, but there's your extension, SV dollar sign. So that is a temporary autosave file. You can see that one was created, actually, that's the one I created just now by having AutoCAD open. In order to use a sol a, uh, an autosave file, if the recovery palette doesn't open, you have to replace the SV dollar sign with DWG. And once you've done that, once you've renamed it, that now becomes an AutoCAD drawing that you can just open up. Now, if when something crashes and you don't get the drawing recovery palette, you can just type in drawing recovery and it'll open that up. And if there are some recovered drawings that you can then go to directly, you can do that here. And the SV dollar sign file, the autosave file, would probably be listed here. But again, there are times when it isn't. If I we'll go back to options now, though, the one thing I would recommend you do is this create a different location than a temporary folder location that is hidden and just put it someplace more convenient for you to find it. So you might have a a folder that is your backup files and just put a location in there for autosave files and then point to it here and you point to it here simply by replacing what's there with the file path that goes to that folder. I did this workshop uh, at Autodesk University several times and this is a page that I passed out for people to sort of jot down as I was going through these things. The broken absolute coordinates, you know, the answer to that one was the DYN IP coords variable, um, lost support file we just went through, and now we'll do to go to misbehaving hatch patterns and then a few other problems that come up. Misbehaving hatch patterns, I'm going to set that one up. So I've got, so I've got something here where I say I want to put a hatch pattern in here. And I put in the hatch pattern and I decide that I need to change the size of the barrier that's holding that hatch pattern. So I pull that out like this nothing changes. And the reason that nothing changes is because a variable sometimes gets turned off that determines whether or not when you select a hash pattern it includes the boundary. And that variable is called HP ASOC. HP ASOC. Hatch Pattern Association. And that variable does get changed periodically. So if I change that variable by typing it in the command line from 0 to 1 as the two settings, now if I place a hash pattern in something and then I make a change in the boundary, the hash pattern will follow suit. And that takes care of that problem. Now there's another problem here. And if I go to erase that hash pattern, which sometimes you do, you place one, you don't like it, you erase it. The boundary goes with it. 
That has to do with a different variable, not HP ASOC. That just associates a hash pattern with the boundary so that it behaves as the boundary changes, it changes as well. There's another variable that controls the way hash patterns and boundaries interact, and that's called pick style. Pick style has four settings. Two of those settings, and this is pick style literally has to do with how objects are grouped together. So if you make a group, you can turn the grouping process on and off using the pick style option or using control H. Control H will turn the group back on and off. You can also do that in options. Um, but the thing about pick style is two of the settings will associate hash patterns with their boundaries. So if I type pick style at the command line, it's currently set to three. That's the fourth of the option. Set it to zero or one. In this case, I'll set it to one. Now, if you put a hatch in something like that, and then you go back and erase a hatch, it'll simply pick the hatch. It won't pick both the hatch and its boundary. The other issue that comes up with hatches is sometimes people want to uh, hatch something and they're expecting this to hatch and then skip and go inside. And that has to do with the island detection variable. And that would be called HP Island Detection, I believe. Let's find out. And type it up here. HP Island, yeah, HP Island Detection. And that has several settings as well. Now, where would you normally make these changes? It wouldn't normally be in system variables. And by the way, you're probably wondering, how do these variables get changed? And the answer is seldom that the user intentionally made a change to those variables. Certainly nobody typed in HP Island Detection. What happens though is on occasion you run a program and some of those programs are the ones that are um, available in as uh, AutoCAD Express tools. Sometimes you run a program and the program itself makes a change to a variable and then fails to change that variable back. That's sort of impolite programming. It's not a very good way to write programs, but there are programs that don't have very good error trapping. If something goes wrong in a program when you run it, sometimes things get left the way they were set for the purposes of that program. However, if you go to the hatch command, or even if you go to the hatch command at the command line by typing negative hatch, and then you pick the settings um, option, and the settings option is right, maybe under properties, I am sorry, there's not a setting, it's, a, it's actually divided up more than that. The various things that affect the way hatch patterns behave can all be set by going to properties or going to advanced. But again, the way you would normally do that is you'd probably be at the at the ribbon. And if you look at the ribbon, <clears throat> there are some settings in the ribbon, but it's not obvious just where they are. So if we take a look at the options right here, we have associative, annotative, match properties. Those are all options of the hatch. You can go to a drop down that opens up and gives you more choices. And those choices allow you to control things like outer island detection. And so you can come in here and change the way that islands are detected. So that would, by making that change, that changes the value of the system variable. You also have something called options here with another little arrow that points off at an angle. And that's hatch settings. If you go there, it opens up the hatch settings and you can make control, make some changes to the way settings for hatch patterns work here as well. And this dialog box, as some dialog boxes do in AutoCAD, has an additional type of arrow that goes to the right. And you do that and it opens up the dialog box and makes it larger. I don't know why it does this, it doesn't open that way, but then it gives you a little visual clue as to how to make those changes. So these variables are actually controlled by things you do in dialog boxes usually. But once in a while they get changed, and if they get changed, then it becomes puzzling, and then you can make the change by either going through the dialog box or going directly to the settings. Let's go, uh, let's go on to the next puzzler. Next puzzler has to do with the fact that you've got a group of things that you want to change on the layer. And you notice all the text on this the maneuvering board from, for um, doing navigating, ocean navigating. Um, you notice all this text is magenta. And if I select any one of these pieces of text, normally I can look up at the command, I mean at the ribbon, and see on the pull down what layer it's on. So you notice right now layer zero is current. If I pick that, well, apparently that's on layer zero. But if I pick this, it also appears to be on layer zero, and yet they're two different colors. Well, that could happen. 
um, people d uh, can change the color of something without changing the layer that it's on. But in this particular case, that's not that's not true. There is a layer called text, and that layer called text is magenta. But any one of these items in this drawing actually has the layer set to by layer. So if I select this and I look up here, it tells me that the color of this is by layer, which means that appears to be on the text layer. If I look up here though, nothing changes as I select it. If I go over to properties and say, well, let's take a look at the properties of that item. In fact, it is on the layer called text. So why doesn't it show up there and why can't I pick this one and put it on the text layer, which is something I've always been able to do. That has to do with a variable called pick first. And pick first, pick first, by the way, I just set text as my current layer when I attempted to move this to that as a layer. Pick first determines whether or not you're using only noun verb, um, I'm sorry, verb noun, or using both verb noun and noun verb as a selection option. Which means that if you are, have been using AutoCAD a long time, you know that you've been, always been able to select something. Well, that's not always true. At one time, you had to indicate what you wanted to do, the verb. So if I wanted to move something to a different layer or change something's layer, I'd have to issue that command and then pick the thing I wanted to change. Autodesk added the possibility of having also noun verb options for selection where you pick something and then indicate what to do with it. If pick first is set to zero, you can't select something and then change what it does. If I change that to one now and I come down here and I grab this now, it tells me what layer that's on and it allows me to change it because it allows me to pick something first and then do something to what I pick. Now, that's one of the selection problems that comes up. Here's the next one that comes up. You Normally, when you select an object like that, and then you just select another object, you're creating a selection set, and it keeps adding every time you select something to the set of objects. Now, all of a sudden, you discover that as you're picking things, it doesn't select the last thing. If you were to hold the Shift key down, that would work. But that's not the way no AutoCAD normally works. And most Windows programs, you have to hold the control key down. If you try doing that, nothing happens at all. So if you get to the point where you're thinking you're going to be selecting things that are being added to the same selection set, that variable is, that controls that is called pick add. And if the pick add variable is set to zero, you cannot completely, you cannot continue to pick things and have them added to the selection set. You have to change that to one. If I come here, now doing nothing, I'm not holding down any keys. Now I can select those, keep adding them to the selection set, and because pick first has been turned back on, I can go and modify the way those things look. Number seven. Number seven is, um, is kind of a sad story behind it. I got a call one time from somebody who was an older early user of AutoCAD and just one of the people who learned AutoCAD in the early 90s and just never bothered to catch up or keep up with the um, the new features that were coming out. He got a job in an office and in the office he got the job at that architectural drawings and they dimensioned everything in paper space which I don't recommend but they did that that's what they did. He had a lot of trouble with the concept of paper space he just didn't understand it and as a result was making a lot of mistakes. When he called me, he had a deadline. It was actually a Friday, and he had a deadline to get something done by the end of the weekend. And he was in kind of a panic because he had to open up an existing drawing that had been done an earlier, much earlier release. He had to make some changes, and when he was trying to add the dimensions and paper space, he was getting this as a result. So here I am. I'm in a drawing. This drawing was done, by the way, in... 1990. In 1990, there was no paper space, there were no dimension styles. Um, you could do the same kinds of things, but there was a lot more involved. There was, and because there was no paper space, everything got plotted from model space. Because things got plotted from model space, the text and the dimensions and all the things that you wanted to plot at a certain height had to be scaled up because it was going to be scaled down. So he added this drawing and he was in paper space and you can see I've got that triangle icon. He decides he's going to put a dimension in here. Let me just change my 
Okay, I'm going to change the running objects now. So we want to put a dimension. The dimension is 44 foot long home or whatever it was. And he got this giant dimension. Kind of backed up and looked to look a look at it and it had two problems. It was huge. And because it was huge, uh, it was unusable. But it also indicated that the dimension for that house was 11 inches and not 44 feet. So he, um, again, was kind of in a panic about this. I actually went to visit him at his office because he was, it was hard for me to explain what to do with, it, to, with this in a way that made sense to him. So let's start with going and looking at the dimension style. The dimension style in this case is standard with overrides because there were no dimension styles when this drawing was done. Therefore, you open it now and it just creates a style called standard and every variable that was changed or set differently in the original drawing is just called an override. So you can right click on overrides and then save them to the current style and now you've got a style that's based on those overrides. But if you go and take a look at this, you've got a couple of things going on. One of them is that the um, arrowhead size is four inches. The text height is six inches. In other words, those dimensions are made so that those, those dimensions can be done in, in uh, model space. If you go to fit, you have an overall scale of one for the dimensions which means the dimensions come in with all the text at six inches so everything looks pretty good. So what you really want to do is you either want to scale the dimensions to the paper space viewport or you want to make them annotative. So if we go back here, if we're going to do either one of those things, what we need to do is set these sizes so they're logical sizes. So a tick mark probably is going to be a sixteenth of an inch, not two inches. And now we would probably be more likely to use an architectural tick rather than that oblique just looks a little more like what most architects use. So we go to the text height. That text height should be set to 0.12. And we should take a look at the uh, yeah, simplex. Yeah, set to zero. So that's fine. It's got an obliquing angle of 15 degrees. So now we've got a few other things here, though, under lines. The extension, two inches. That really should be a sixteenth of an inch. Actual sizes is what we're trying to put in here. And then the offset from the origin, also a sixteenth of an inch. Now things look a little bit better. We come out, we close this up. <clears throat> and now those, because they were already placed, they look fine right now. Now again, I'm back in paper space, which is where he wants to add his dimensions. And so I'm going to go now and put that dimension in to see what happens. And now it comes in the right size. Everything looks a lot better, but it is the wrong dimension. So why is it the wrong dimension? Because back then, there was no variable that would control the associativity between objects in model space and objects in paper space. So there is a variable called dimASO that still exists, and that would have either a 0 or a 1 as a setting. There's been a new variable added since then, which is dim ASSOC, which can have a 0, a 1, or a 2 as a setting. Um, and that is obviously much bigger than I meant it to be. So let's go over to properties and change that. So instead of being 1 foot, smaller than 1 foot, make it a 10. So that's the dim ASO variable. Dim ASS OC variable is the one that can be 0, 1, or 2. So what's the difference? Dim ASO just means either a dimension is exploded when you put it in, if you set that to 0, or it's a block when you put it in, if you set it to 1. It's associated with the definition points, not with the actual geometry. So what we want is to be able to put a dimension that goes from one end of this corner of the house to the other and get the true size. To do that, what you need to do is set dim ASSOC equal to 2. The reason it's set to 1 is because since there was no variable dim ASOC back when this drawing was done, the variable dim ASO setting is used for the setting for dim ASSOC when you open it in a newer release. Now that I've done that, I can go in now and say what's the distance from that corner to that corner. 
Now, not only does it look right, the dimension itself are the right sizes, but it also shows me the actual length of that house, which is 44 feet. This does bring up another problem, which is what if you wanted to put all of those dimensions into paper space? Because that's what this office was doing. So we'll just try that. We're in model space right now. We'll use the change space command. And let's just change the location of all these dimensions right here and put those in paper space. Okay, we're in model space. We're going to try to change them. Come over here. We do that. Say, so let's change them. So it scaled them and it scaled them so they'd maintain their visual look. Now they're in paper space, which is where he wants them. So he would be able, if he wanted to, to move all of his dimensions into paper space. Still has a little bit of a problem with consistency as far as the types of dimension style that he has. But that's what we did to get him to fix that problem. Next puzzler comes from the um, civil arena. And it has to do with something I, I've seen multiple times and always in civil drawings. So what we have here is a civil plan. And the civil plan is a building and that building is the child development center at the school that I teach at. And I believe it's about, yeah, it's about 70 feet long, about 60 feet wide. So we're looking at dimensions in that building itself right there. And what's under it is the, uh, is the, is the contour lines in the plot plan or the civil drawing. But that's where the building was going to go. So the problem here is this. We were using it to try to design a new playground for them. And one of my students said, I've got a problem here. And we went and looked and he said, you know, this is a curbing. Put the end point on here again. This is a curbing. And if I say, what's the distance from here to here? I know it's half a foot and it comes out half a foot, six inches. If I come over here and say, what's the distance from here to here? That's also half a foot. But there's this opening here, the curb cut. If I do that, it tells me it's 95 feet. There's just no way that can be 95 feet, what's going on. So if I said, well, let's take a look at the, at the um, command prompt. Look at the command prompt, the distance command, D-I-S-T, gives you a, dr a direct distance between two points, but it also gives you the, the change in the X direction and the change in the Y direction, as well as the change in the Z direction. It also tells you the angle both in the X or Y plane, which is on the plane that you're looking at. In an AutoCAD, when you're drawing, you're always drawing in a 3D environment, and that's always been true, right? From 1987, 88, when I first saw the software, you're always drawing in three dimensions. But by default, you're looking at the floor, the plan view, or the ground, and you're drawing on a flat plane that has an X and a Y value, and you're drawing with a Z value of zero. If you'll notice, that means you can have an, an angle in the XY plane, which is an angle on that surface, on that plane surface. You can also have an angle from the XY plane. And the two points that I just picked have an angle from the XY plane of 271. The distance between them is 95, but the change in X is only a foot 10. The change is y in Y is only about a foot. It's the change in Z that's causing the problem. In other words, this drawing has a lot of different elevations in the drawing itself. So that's what the drawing looks like. I don't know why this happens with civil drawings. I don't know if it's because people are trying to draw with elevations that mimic the kinds of elevations in the, in the actual, on the ground, or if it is a result of some third party piece of software. But I've seen this often enough that I recognize that it's a problem in this situation. And um, Autodesk or somebody at Autodesk recognized it's a problem because they came up with a solution for it. If I do a plan view looking straight down and use a command called flatten and then pick all the entities in the drawing and press enter, it'll go through and analyze every single entity and it'll put all the entities on the same plane. I have to say no, don't remove hidden lines. Now, I don't know if you can tell if you look at the drawing that things are going on here. There it is, now it's regenerating. It's doing a lot of work because it's looking at every single entity and then modifying the entity so they appear to be at the same plane. And then once it's done, which is now, and we look at it now, this whole thing is now looks like it's a flat surface. This does almost everything. It does, however, not affect things like this. Now, if I'm not sure what that is, I can hover over it. It tells me it's a polyline. And I've got this set up so it'll give me the area. 
But if I select it and go to properties to say, what is this thing? It's a polyline, but it's not just any polyline. If you look down through at the other properties, it's a polyline that has a thickness assigned to it. And this drawing was done in feet because it's a civil drawing. So someone decided, wouldn't it be cool if we built walls that were eight feet tall? That's not the way to draw in 3D in AutoCAD. This thickness option is virtually useless, but it's been there ever since the beginning. And it allows you to give a three-dimensional um, aspect to any entity, text, whatever you want. So the solution, if you really want that to be flattened, is either to find a program that's on the web called Super Flatten, or simply set the, the thickness value for everything in the drawing to zero. So I could just get everything in this drawing, just to make sure, after I run Flatten, go and grab it, go over to Properties, and under Properties, do I have that option? I don't because I've picked some things that can't have a thickness. So if I go to the polylines, polylines can have thickness, they vary. We can set all the thickness for all the polylines to zero. Now, everything on this drawing is flat, no matter what. So the flatten command is the one to take care of that for you. Again, there is something called super flatten. It's a program, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's available online. Um, if you just type that in, you'll find it. And it, it really goes through and it does a better job than Flatten does. This next puzzler has to do with line types on polyline. So I'm opening this up and you notice that two of them have hidden lines, one of them doesn't. And immediately you're thinking, of course, that this one has, it's either on a different layer, it has a different line type associated with it. But if we take all three of them and look over here, all three of them, color is by layer, line weight is by layer, and line type is by layer, and they're all on the hidden layer. And that's true because otherwise it wouldn't display anything in there if they had different values. So in order to figure out what's different about them, the strategy here is to go to properties, and in properties, take a look and see what varies among all the properties of all three of them. If I look over here, you know, the layer doesn't vary, the line type doesn't vary, the line type scale doesn't vary. Come back all the way down, area and length, they do vary. Well, that would make sense. But then down here, you've got this miscellaneous called line type generation. It varies. If you look at it, you've got two options, enabled, and if you pick that for all of them, now they all look good, or disabled, and now the only one that looks good is the rectangle. So if I do enable it for all three of them, that means that you're going to break down your line type, and the length of the line type is defined by the, the ACAD LAN file. So in order for something to have a hidden line type, it's got to be long enough for that segment to show up and a break to show up and then another segment to show up. If you take a look at a spline or a spline polyline, the distance from vertex to vertex is too short for that breakup to take place between vertexes. So line type generation just means let's treat an irregular p-line or any other kind of p-line, um, let's treat it as a single object and we'll just break up the line type along the entire thing instead of vertex to vertex. That works much better on something like this. Unfortunately, on something with a rectangle, it causes this problem, where you sometimes don't have clean corners. So what I would do in a case like this, is line type generation would be something I would turn on for anything that was irregular or didn't have segment lengths that were long enough to break down into the line type I wanted. But for something like the rectangle, or if say, the, say I had a rectangle um, around uh, the footing on a, on a foundation, for something like a rectangle, I would disable it because if you disable it for the rectangle but enable it for everything else, you get nice clean corners, which is what you want for hidden lines. This next puzzler might or might not of any at any time be useful to you, um, but <clears throat> I'm going to show it to you because it came up in a legal case that I was involved with. I had the chance to be involved with two legal cases, as it turns out. Um, and the case involved uh, two companies in the United States that made the same product, and there were only two of them, <clears throat> and it was a fairly sophisticated uh, product. And one company hired, they had designer from the other company away from that, per that company, and suddenly was producing exactly the same product. Company A, the company from whom the designer was hired, went to court. They got 
uh, control of the computers in, the, in Company B and said, when you hired our guy, he took our intellectual property with him. He took files with him, and then you guys used those to make this product. That ended up as a uh, major legal battle. I need to um, show this in two different ways. And in order to do that, I'm going to turn menu bar on by setting it to 1 so that I can now tile vertically. All right, I'll get rid of this one. So I've got two drawings here now. I've got two drawings here. This one is one product, and over here is another product that's similar but with some differences. So we're just going to look at two of the differences. So the issue was this: the uh, company, one of the companies in Maine, the other one is someplace out in the in the Midwest. The company in Maine was the company from whom their designer was hired, and they were the ones claiming that the other company had stolen their intellectual property. The law firm that was hired in Maine to represent the other company, the Midwestern company, asked me if I would look at the two drawings because they were convinced that the guy who had been hired and had, had uh, taken that knowledge with him, that he was telling them the truth when he said, no, I didn't copy their files. I just redesigned this out of my experience. And it, the product, of course, is appears similar because I redesigned it. Well, here's the thing. They had, the, they had the, uh, the computers, and so they had files. And so the company that was representing the, the um, company, the uh, law firm that was representing the company that was accused of stealing intellectual property in an attempt to prove that that hadn't happened, asked me to analyze the two drawings and then to come to a conclusion that they were not the same drawing. It took me uh, one minute to look at it and say, no, your guy's lying. He did steal this drawing because there were some really unusual errors that were identical in both drawings. It just couldn't happen. But that wasn't enough for the law firm. They wanted me to actually come up with something that was definitive. Now, I thought that was definitive, but what I did is I went and analyzed all the entities in both drawings, and there were several thousand, but I didn't do it one at a time. I wrote a program, and I wrote a program to do something that would compare them in a certain way. So what I'm going to do is show you um, that in this case, you see there's an overhang. This is, by the way, just a drawing I did for a playhouse that I built for uh, for several several playhouses I built for the children of, of friends and for nieces and nephews over the years. So let's just say this was yours and this is mine or the other way around. And you say, hey, you stole my drawing. And I go, no, I just did it myself. And it happens to look like yours, but it's not. Look at this. I mean, that's different than this. So I couldn't have stolen it. Autodesk, uh, AutoCAD, when it sets, um, when it creates an entity, assigns every entity in the drawing with a unique handle. And that handle can be found by looking at the list command. So if I take that line and type li for list, the handle is 7d8 on that line. Now a handle is a unique name. It's a unique name in that drawing. And it's randomly assigned. It is, is essentially, it's a, um, a name, but it is a hexadecimal value. It's a numerical value. The reason there are letters is because the hexadecimal system is a base 16 system. So it starts counting with zero and when it gets to nine it then goes to A, B, C, D, E, and F. So when you look at something like this you're actually looking at a numerical value assigned to that and the D is simply a placeholder in the same sense that a one or a two would be a placeholder. So 7D8 is a unique name for that one item. If I come over here and I take the same item in this other drawing and I say, let's do a list on that, it has the same name. Now, it is conceivable that one item that was similar in two different drawings might have been assigned randomly the same name, although it's unusual, it would be incredibly, it would be really, really unusual. However, what I did was analyze every single entity in the drawing and every one of them had the same name. So once I go to the next one and say, well, what's the handle on that? 7D7. And I go in here and grab this and do the list command and say, what's the handle on that? 7D7. So if you're in a situation where you think somebody else has used one of your drawings and they claim they didn't and you have both drawings, you can actually determine whether or not the entities in one drawing started as the entities in another one by comparing their handles. And the list command is the, well, it's the most direct way to get the handle. There are other ways using programming, but that's the most direct way to get the handle. Now, that same case brought up another interesting problem that I solved with handles. And this other interesting problem I'll pose 
in these terms. The reason it came up in that case is that once I um, made it clear to the law firm that their fellow had in fact taken the drawing, then he said, well, no, I actually designed it from scratch. But when I was done, I was cleaning out my trunk in my car and I discovered a floppy disk and realized that it had a copy of the drawing on it. I hadn't used it, but it had it on it. And I thought, well, I'll just bring it in so I can compare it. So I did all the work myself and then I brought that drawing in at the end. That's why it looks like all those entities are the same. Um, that was an absurd argument for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that I can also tell you exactly what order everything in a drawing was done. And here's how we do it. And I'm going to put this in a context that's not necessarily a legal case. I've got two sets of stairs here and I was designing and I tried two different things and I want to go with my most recent because that was the new revision, but I don't remember which one it was. I just, I didn't name the layers very, very carefully. I didn't make very good notes. I don't remember that I do the blue set of stairs first or the red set of stairs first. Well, I'll go back to the handle issue. On the handle issue, I can say, let's take that object right there. It has a handle, and its handle is AE. Then I'll say, let's take this, at, this item right here. It has a handle, and its handle is 10A. Now, if you count in a decimal, a hexadecimal system, you could figure out which of those numbers came first. But most of us don't count in hexadecimal. Well, you can go to a converter and do it. But there is a way to do that without having to be able to count in hexadecimal. And the way to do that is to open up a DXF file. Now, a DXF file is a drawing exchange format file that Autodesk created as a format years ago so that you could go from one CAD package to another. And it's become kind of the de facto general um, conversion uh, format for, for CAD files. It is, in fact, a text file. So I'm going to go to Notepad. I'm going to type at the AutoCAD command line once I get my typing fingers going. So I'm going to open up Notepad. And on Notepad, I'm going to go and open up one of these DXF files. I'm going to open the DXF file that's associated with this drawing. In other words, I saved this drawing as a DXF file. Just in case you're not sure what I'm talking about with that. If I go to Save As, instead of saving as a drawing file, I come down here and pick DXF. I can save it as a format that can be then read by many other programs. So 13DXF is what I called this drawing. So I go to Notepad. In a Notepad, I open up that DXF file. Now I have to change the documents I'm looking for from TXT to DXF. So there it is right there. It opens up and this, believe it or not, is a complete text-based description of, of a drawing. So what I want to do is I want to look and see where, I'm going to do a find, where does AE show up as an item? And it shows up right there. Um, you don't need to understand this, but this is header material. It tells me that the, the item itself was a lightweight polyline. Five is the handle, and well, five is the heading meaning handle, and AE is the unique name given to it. That's on line 2748. I go up here and say, where's 10A? which is the other one, 10A is on line 3,800. So 10A clearly got made after AE. So I go back to check and say, well, it, which one was it? That's 10A right there. It tells me that here. That means that the red one is the more recent of the two revisions. That's how that knowing that might be helpful to you. The uh, next puzzler comes from somebody who, um, I'm going to close up my ribbon here. I don't need that anymore give myself a little more room. Uh, it comes from somebody who needed to send a drawing to a client that was using an earlier release of AutoCAD. And AutoCAD comes with formats. Each format um, every year is a, is a specific format. Now an AutoCAD is different than most other CAD packages. Things like SolidWorks and Revit, every year they change the format. Which means if you're one year behind me and I create a drawing in the most current release of SolidWorks or the most current release of Revit, and you're one release behind, you can't open any files that I send you. Which is, well, it's a way primarily to get everyone to be on subscription, because if you're not on subscription with the latest issue, the latest format, um, or the latest release, then you're unable to work with other people very easily. So, but you know, a lot of people do have earlier releases of, of AutoCAD, especially back when, when you purchased AutoCAD, you bought a, what's called a uh, perpetual license. You bought it, you owned it. Now you rent the software by the year and you pay a yearly fee. Um, but there are still people working in the field that are using older versions because, you know, a lot of companies don't upgrade immediately. 
AutoCAD, unlike others though, will have multiple releases that use the same file format. So if you're, if you're using release 2010 and I'm using release 2012, I can send you a file that I've created and you can open it. If I have 2013 and try sending it to you, you can't open it up. Now, so the question is, how can I tell without opening the drawing? When you open a drawing, it'll tell you what release it was done in. And you can also save a drawing in any release you want. So if I go to save as here and I go to the drop down, I can go all the way back to release 12, which is 1994 or something um, as a DXF file. But I can go back to release 14 as an actual drawing file. So I can open up a drawing, save it in an early release and send it to somebody. But if I don't want to do that, and I just want to take a look at the files themselves and go, he wants five drawings. Which of these is going to be ones he can open and which do I have to up uh, downgrade for him? There's a way to do that. And the way to do that is to go to, to Notepad and to open up a DWG file, which is not a text file. It's not like a DXF file, but it has a little bit of information right at the beginning. So I'm going to go to Open. And again, I have to change from text documents to all files, and I'll just grab any drawing file. At the very top, there are six characters, AC for AutoCAD, and then a four-digit number. And that number indicates what format, file format, the drawing was saved in. So that determines whether or not you can open it in an earlier, in whatever release you're using. Unfortunately, those numbers don't, they don't necessarily match up with the release numbers, so it's not obvious when you look at it what they are. But if you can open up, and you can, using Notepad, any DWG file, you can see that this one is AC1021, and I happen to know that that was released 2007. But if I open up a different file, I've got one that I know is newer because I just created it as newer, and that's number three. It doesn't, it has 1032, 1032 could be a 2021. So how do you know that? Well, you have to know it by looking someplace. And what I did was I compiled a list of what those numbers are and how they match up to the different releases. So, you know, we're right now in 2021. So 2021, 2020, 2019, and 2018, those four releases all use the same file format and the number that you would find up there would be AC 1032. The last three years before that, 11, 12, and 13, 1027. 10, 11, and 12, um, something is weird there. I have a mistake. 7, 8, and 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, yeah, that should be 14, 15, and 16 should be someplace, and 17 as well. Um, so I've, I made an error when I did this and didn't notice that I left something out. Uh, but, but these numbers, and I'll update that. In fact, I'll do that right now. Uh, and I did. I, I just had left off 2016 and 2017. So that number right there refers to any one of those five releases. Uh, and now we have four releases. I don't know if they're going to go to a five release or not. Anyway, that's how you can do it. Now, that means that you could just go into, a, into Windows Explorer, use Notepad, open up a group of files, and then quickly know what release it was so you could determine whether or not you have to then open the drawing in AutoCAD, save it back to an early release, and then send it to them. Um, I also, this was interesting enough as a problem that I wrote a list program that would allow somebody to just go in and go look at a list of drawings and then say, well, how about that one? It'll tell you what release that was in, what format that was in. We can go to this one. It'll tell you that based on that number. So that list program is set up so it'll go through and allow you to just pick something from, from AutoCAD. But you do have to be in AutoCAD. But I also wrote another program that would create a file that would list every drawing on a hard drive and tell you the release that it was done in. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here's what I did for my C drive, the one I'm sitting on right now. So the program that I wrote, and something you run from AutoCAD, went through the entire C drive, found every drawing file, indicated where that was. So these are all the past statements, the name of it, and then indicate what release it was saved in based on that little number in the front. And you can see it went through and did that in about two and a half minutes, by the way. 
And I believe there are 11,000 or so lines in here. Let's find out. Yeah, we're down in, uh, yeah, well, 14,760 drawings on my C drive, on my computer, in my office, and home. So um, that, and therefore, then gives you something that you can then create as a database. You can put in a spreadsheet. You can search on it uh, if you want to know. So I did this so that that person could create this file and then have it to use so they could make that decision. There are some uh, other uh, free software that AutoCAD has available, um, DWG Convert and DWG TrueView, that allow you to look at things or allow you to convert from one format to another. It's not as simple as just changing that number, by the way, in order to be able to open up a drawing. Next puzzler came from somebody that was frustrated because someone else had used the computer in the office they normally use and changed some settings and they weren't sure what got changed but things weren't working the same way wanted to know if there was an easy way to get back to what they had there are several ways that you can help yourself in that regard um, and <clears throat> one of them is the one I ended up using and I showed you earlier and that was if you go over to the program uh, in in uh, Windows, and you look under Auto under I'm sorry, not under Autodesk, under AutoCAD 2021, there's something called Reset Savings to Default. So if you wanted to reset his savings his settings back to the default, you could do that. That's not necessarily the best way to do this. Um, a couple other ways you can if those settings got changed, you just want to put them back, and that's before. <laughs> Before this happens, you, you set yourself up with a file that's specifically designed to do that. There's an express tool in AutoCAD, and the express tool in AutoCAD is called Sys, Sys VDLG. Is that right? Indeed it is. And it opens up, and it gives you a list of all of the system variables in AutoCAD, and it's a really useful tool. Because it allows you to go in, for instance, we looked at the X edit variable. If I pick X edit, it comes over here and it tells me what the current value is, the new value, the, the initial value, and then it tells in here, it describes what it does, controls whether or not the current drawing can be edited in place when being referenced by another drawing. Normally I should say zero. Zero means it would not be able to be edited, one means it can, but the default is one. So that tells you what those things are. The thing about this is once you've made a bunch of changes and a lot of those changes you didn't make directly to the variables you made them in dialog boxes you can then save a collection in an svf file which is just a text file so you can save this and i could call this dan's favorite settings or whatever i want to call it i save it then if at some point something goes wrong, I could go back in there and then I can read that back in. And then I just go and read it in. Now that might have solved the problem I had earlier with the unhandled exception error. I don't know for sure, because um, I ended up going back and doing a clean sweep because I make so many changes when I'm, when I'm teaching and doing things. But that's one possibility. There is a, uh, another, which is to create a script for yourself and a script that you can then run anytime you wanted. Um, there is a script that is set up called default that comes shipped with AutoCAD. A little bit hard to find, but it is a listing of almost every one of the variables as in their current settings. And you could go in and modify that file if you wanted and then run it as a script file. So the command for running something is called script. You'll notice I do have yeah, I have one called defaults right there. So that's the one that comes shipped with AutoCAD. If I were to open that up um, and take a look at it, can I do that from here or not? No, let me go and do it and open it up in Notepad. So I'm going to go back to Notepad. By the way, Notepad is an external command in AutoCAD by default. That's why I can type Notepad at the command line. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a script file that is on the C drive in my puzzlers folder and it's called defaults and looks right here okay so this is a listing here of all of the variables in AutoCAD 
most almost every variable a couple of really new ones that didn't get put into this one but these are all the variables with the settings and you can run this as a script and it would do something similar to what restore defaults would do for you in the at the windows um, program button uh, the run button but the thing about this is you could also just put in the ones you want so there might be things you want to change so again I'm a big proponent of saying X edit should be set to zero. So what I would do here is set this one to zero, then save it. Now, anytime and you do that with any variables that get changed that you want to make sure get changed back. Now what you can do is go to the script command and then find that file and then run it. And when you do run it, it'll reset all of your variables based on the, on the items in that, in that document. We're in puzzler 15 actually 17 but I skipped a couple um, this came up from a company that did, did a lot of work on very long parts and the very long parts were big pieces of pipe where the interesting stuff was happening at either end and their dilemma was this <clears throat> and they were old-school drafters using AutoCAD because if I went over and said let's uh, let's set up a layout here if I go to a layout like this and I decide to set that up with a scale that I can plot at say 1 to 5 by the time I get it done, the detail at the end is just so small that it's not going to show up very well. So the conventional break would normally be done on a drafting table would be to whack a piece out of the middle of this and then push the two ends closer together. And that's what they were doing in this one company. They were just they weren't drawing to full size, in other words. The problem was that they also were then using the drawing or some of the other engineers using the drawing and they wanted to put them into assemblies where they wanted them to be full size. So they had a difficult problem and a little difference of, of opinion on the, in the part of the, of the two different groups of engineers. Do we just draw the ends and not worry about the actual size of this thing because, you know, we're going to put a conventional break in it anyway? Or do we actually draw everything full size the way Dan says you should always do everything? And so the question was, what do you do in a situation like this? And here's a solution to that you always draw full size. There's just no reason to spend the kind of money you spend for software and the time and the whole thing. But what you do is you set it up so it looks like this. Now right now, <clears throat> if I do a preview on this, you see what I've got is this end and this end and it's probably pretty obvious that I'm in paper space. I've got a viewport here. I've got another viewport here. They're at the same scale. They show opposite ends of this thing. The dimension that you're looking at here goes all the way through, obviously, to the other end. And then in between, you've got a little space. And what you can do in that little space is you can put a conventional break symbol there. And to do that conventional break symbol, I'm going to go over to my blocks current drawing. And there's my conventional break symbol. Now, I drew this symbol so that it represents a piece of pipe, or not pipe in this case, it would be solid. This isn't a piece of pipe, it's an arbor, so it's a solid piece. It, have a, it would have a different conventional break if it were hollow. But I made this to fit on something that was one inch. So I bring this in and you notice it's, it's just to, oops, I need to be in paper space for this. And you notice I just changed my scale of that too. So I'm going to go and, and change it back. All right. So now I'm in paper space now. So I'm going to go and I'm going to get that conventional break and I'm going to bring it in. The problem is it doesn't quite fit. And it doesn't quite fit because I made it for a one inch um, piece of uh, round stock. This round stock is 2.25, but the scale is 1 to 2. If I look at any one of these viewports, it's a 1 to 2 scale. That means in paper space, what I want is for something that goes from here to here, and that would measure on the sheet of paper 1.125 inches. So I'm going to go and get that block. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to scale it in the X direction, 1.125. And in the Y direction, I'm going to do the same, 1.125. And now, when I bring it in, it's going to come in the right size. And I can track off of one end until I get the intersection of that. Intersection is not turned on as a running object snap. So let me go and turn it on. I like in, uh, extension as well. I like midpoint as well. Intersection should be there. All right, so now those are turned on. Okay, now I go back and get that block, and it's already been scaled. I did that down here. I'm going to track off of here until I hit the intersection right there. 
still not getting the intersection. Let me see why that is. Um, I might need a parent intersection as well. Let me do that again. Extension, midpoint, parent intersection. Okay, what I'm doing is I want to make sure I track to the point where it's actually an accurate location. So I'm using geometry here and I want to track to the intersection of, there it is right there. So now that goes to the intersection of the edge of the viewport. And that's the only way I know of that you can basically use entities in both model space and paper space at the same time to accurately place things. I tracked off the end of this and my tracking line went till it hit the apparent intersection of the edge of the viewport. So now that comes in, if I do a preview on this now, that's exactly what you would have done on a drafting table in order to make something that was a conventional break. The beauty of this is, if I were to go over here and edit the length of this, so right now it's 31.625, if I do that, it changes overall because that's the dimension going across for the entire thing. Now the one last thing that I would do is go up here, I go to, my, I'd go to the dimension layer, Go and make sure I'm on that layer. I go to the dimension layer and I draw a line and I draw the line going from here to here. Now again, I can't, there's nothing to snap to there because it just goes beyond the edge of that. So what I have to do is find something to track from like that. So I'm tracking from this. I'm going to track over. I'm going to find something to track from and then track over until I get to the intersection and then go from there to that intersection. There we go. So now I've got a line that goes across. I'll do another one. I'm going to track off of the end of that. Come over till it hits the intersection at the edge of the viewport. Another intersection there. Now when I do a preview and I print this out, it's going to look exactly like the two sort of older school guys wanted it to look, but they can still draw everything full size and have it come out right. Well, 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 why don't we go ahead and, and actually lay one out to show you how I would do it because there's also a puzzle that came up when they tried to do it themselves. So I've got a sheet here and I want to set it up that way. What I'm going to do is zoom right in on one end and figure out what scale would work for that. And what we use on the other one is one to two. So that's what we're going to do on this. So I'll make my viewport so that it takes up about half the sheet. Of course, I'd have a title block in here and everything as well. So just about half the sheet. Double click, bring it over here where I can see everything, maybe about like that. Make sure it's one to two, lock the viewport. Now I would copy that viewport and I would use tracking to copy it so that it goes straight to the right and lines right up, say right about there. Then I would double click inside this one and I would unlock it. Now you can't just press the middle wheel down and pan around because it's now no longer going to be lined up. So I would use the negative pan command. And the negative pan command allows me to use a tracking line. So I would say let's go from here in that direction right there, say 25 inches. Comes over here like that, which is just about right. Do it again, bring it back say 4 inches. That's a little better come here, bring it back, say two inches. So you see what I'm doing is I'm just kind of honing in on what I need. So now I've got that set up. So it's got the same view magnification in both. So the same viewport scale in both. And now I can go ahead and bring in that, that um, conventional break. And then I can modify, if I have to, I can make adjustments to this for the width of that break and make whatever distance I want between them. Um, so again, I'd come over here. We already did the calculations on that. Bring it down here, place it so it goes to that intersection right there. You know, I have never had trouble getting the intersection of the, oh, there it was. Never had trouble doing it before, and it was doing it that time. So it's tracking off of that, coming over till we hit the intersection right there. Now, again, what I could do here is say, let's move this by stretching it. And we could stretch it so it comes out and that touches the top of that. And one way to do that would be to just bring a line up here like that. And then indicate that we want to stretch the corner of this by having it come from here 
perpendicular to here. Oop, that's a line. I want to do this from here perpendicular to that edge right there. Now it stretches right over and now it lines right up. So that's how you would, would manage it if you wanted to have it look right. Um, okay, the next one has to do with finding out when you're doing work with somebody else's drawing that there are some inaccuracies in the dimensions. Now it is a bad idea generally. It's a bad idea generally. We're going back to this kind of drawing, but there's another version. It's a bad idea generally to do this, but people can and often do override dimensions. They don't make the geometry accurate or they make a change of some kind. They don't have time or don't take the time to redo the geometry. So they just type in a new value. And you're working on something and you're assuming that all these dimensions, since none of them have been exploded, that they're all correct. And you discover in one place that there's a dimension that is not accurate. It has been overwritten. How do you discover overwritten dimensions? This is a very nice tool in AutoCAD called Dim Reasoc. And Dim Reasoc stands for Dim Reassociate. And it allows you to take all the dimensions in the drawing and any of those dimensions that have been overridden will be then updated if you want them to be. So all I did was type the dim reasoc as a command, all, so it would pick every dimension visible. And you'll notice it only selected three, and the three that it selected have all been overridden. So if I would now, that's 2.700, 1.370, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, 5.9, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.80, 5.81, 5.82, 5.83, 5.84, 5.85, 5.86, 5.87, 5.88, 5.89, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.79, 5.90, 5.91, 5.92, 5.93, 5.94, 5.95, 5.96, 5.97, 5.98, 5.99, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12, 5.13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23, 5.24, 5.25, 5.26, 5.27, 5.28, 5.29, 5.30, 5.31, 5.32, 5.33, 5.34, 5.35, 5.36, 5.37, 5.38, 5.39, 5.40, 5.41, 5.42, 5.43, 5.44, 5.45, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 5.69, 5.70, 5.71, 5.72, 5.73, 5.74, 5.75, 5.76, 5.77, 5.78, 5.
that's multiple lines together or on top of each other and that's a problem because now if you're trying to get the midpoint if you're trying to do something that is symmetrical and you miss it because you've got a line that doesn't have the midpoint you think it does or you have a little line segment someplace and you're going to an end point somewhere like look at this I even have a, a, a midpoint right here so I think I'm going to an end point that means there's going to be another little end point over here someplace and there's a midpoint. So there's another end point right there. So if I'm zoomed out, I could easily think I'm going to this end over here and then be in that end if I've got two little line segments. So AutoCAD has another command that's also very useful for that situation. And that's the overkill command that allows you to go in, apply overkill to everything in the drawing, determine what it is you want changed. And in this particular case, what I want is anything that are this, I want them connected together. Anything that's this, I want them eliminated and replaced with something that's a single entity. So if I've got a bunch of little entities strung together and four or five things on top and they're in exactly the right place, I want all of that replaced with just one line. Come back over here, it tells me it got rid of 136 duplicates in this drawing, two overlapping objects or segments. So now if I were to go and want the midpoint of that line, that's the actual midpoint of a single line as opposed to a bunch of little lines. We're going to move on, but that's it for this drawing. Okay, it's not quite it for this drawing. There's one other thing that I uh, forgot to mention. The technique for setting one of these up, where you use a viewport, copy it, use the pan command from the command line, negative pan, so that you get a straight... Um, orthographic or, or ortho tracking um, way of panning so that everything still lines up very very helpful but what happens when you didn't do that what happens when for instance you have one that's out of sync like that they're both exactly the same uh, viewport scale but they don't line right up and it's a little bit tricky because of course you can't snap to both paper space and model space at the same time usually and there's no intersection of any kind here actually so there are a couple things you could do as workarounds but there is a tool in AutoCAD called MV Setup and MV Setup is actually designed it's an express tool MV Setup is actually designed to set up multiple viewports when you have three-dimensional objects so you can have a front view a right side view and a top view however it has this align function that allows you to go into an active viewport and so we're going to do horizontal. Go into an active viewport and pick a base point. So if I came in here, let's go to endpoint. And I say I want to take that endpoint as my base point. Now it says select point to in viewport to be panned. If I come over here and I select another point that has to line up with it there. Let me try that once again. MV setup. I haven't tried this in the new version of AutoCAD. I certainly hope it still works. All right, I want a horizontal alignment. My base point is going to be the end point right there. Specify the point in the viewport to be panned. That would be over here. And that point would be this one right there. Well, that is interesting. Oh. I have to unlock the viewport. It's going to do a pan function. I have that viewport locked right now. Of course, I lock my viewports all the time. So this is the one that has to be moved. So let's try it now and see if that works. So MV setup, align, horizontal. Base point is going to be the end point of that. Come over here. It's going to be the end point of that. There we go. So you have to unlock the viewport. That does make sense. Um, so it's nothing that changed in the new version of AutoCAD. But you notice what it did now is line them up. As long as your viewport scale in both viewports is the same, that will now allows you to put these things in a situation where you can then add the conventional break in between. That's it for this drawing. So this next one, uh, there's really, it's not, I don't need to illustrate it, I don't think. It has to do with this. Let me bring a document over here. There are two types of LISP files, LSP files that are automatically loaded. There's actually a couple of others as well, but for our purposes, from the user point of view, there's an ACAD.LSP file or an ACAD doc.LSP file, neither of which 
comes shipped with AutoCAD. Those are both things that you, as a user, you would create. At one time, there was simply one. And so some people who are kind of old timers at this point, who at one time had a file called ACAD.LSP, if you put that in the search path, when AutoCAD starts up, it would open up that file and any Lisp programs that were inside that file would then be loaded. So it was a way to have commands that you'd created that were special commands you wanted access to all the time. In my case, there's a whole bunch of them that I use for grading um, and I want them available all the time and so I have them in a file that loads in every drawing. The ACAD LSP file used to load in every drawing, but they added when they went to multiple document mode, which seems like so long ago, because it was, they added a file ACAD doc LSP, and that's what this one is right here. And that became the auto list file that would auto load everything every single time you opened a new drawing. And by default, ACAD LSP only loads in the first drawing that you start when you first start AutoCAD. I use that distinction in the lab when we're teaching, when I'm teaching in the lab, to have certain things happen when students start AutoCAD and it gives them a little message, in fact, a little alert box. But I don't want that popping up every time they start a new drawing. So I put that um, little alert in the ACAD.LSP file. And then I also have an ACAD doc.LSP file that I use and that I have students create and that you're going to have to create for this class. And in that one, which is also going to be in the search path that AutoCAD looks when it's looking for information, and that one I put all the commands I want available to me all the time. So if the behavior um, is not, does not suit you, if what you want, and this is a call that I've gotten a few times in the past, I want my ACAD LSP file to load every time, then you have to change a variable called ACAD LSP as doc. That's the name of the variable. Change that to one, now the ACAD LSP file will be treated as though it's an ACAD doc.lsp file. Personally, I've always recommended when I do consulting work, just change the name of this one to ACAD doc, and then you don't have to worry about that variable. And if at some point you do want to have something happen only when you first start AutoCAD, you still have that option. Um, as long as I'm right here, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> the next one had to do with um, being asked if there's a way when you set up a, a layout in AutoCAD to have a viewport inside another viewport that actually contains different data. And the other issue that came up is, is it possible to have a place you can just put text or something else on top of a viewport without having um, to use the wipeout? The wipeout is a function of AutoCAD that's been around for a while. And what it does is it creates an entity that goes theoretically under something, but over something else. And it really just duplicates the background color in AutoCAD so that it just wipes out anything under it. The problem is that draw order isn't always consistent in AutoCAD. And draw order just means if you've got three entities that are all on the same plane, which ones of them, which one of them is going to be drawn first, which one's going to be drawn second, which one's going to be drawn third, etc. And that determines how they appear on the screen. Unfortunately, wipeout sometimes fails to work and you have to use the draw order command to rearrange things. Um, also, sometimes when you plot, wipeout is not um, taken into account depending on how you're plotting and what you're plotting to. So that's not a very good, a very good solution. The other solution that one company had was if they had an area like this that they wanted to put something else in, they would delete the entities in model space that were in the way and then put whatever they wanted on top, which meant, of course, then they lost entities in model space. So clearly that's not a good idea. So this is the solution. This one was one that took me a little while. I, was, I got this question when I was doing a workshop at Autodesk University, and afterwards somebody asked me about it. And it wasn't obvious to me immediately how I would solve that. Uh, but as we were talking, I thought, you know, you can make a viewport out of an object. You can make a viewport out of a closed P-line. You can make a viewport out of a circle. Um, and you can make a viewport out of a region. Well, a region gives you an advantage in the sense that a region is something that consists of it's basically a three-dimensional object that's been reduced to a thickness of zero, or a z-axis of zero. So you can use Boolean functions on it, which means you can have entities that are regions and you can add and subtract things to the region. What we're looking at right here is a solution I came up with which involved creating a region that had an island in it, and the island in this case is that circle. 
Now, I'm using this as an example of how you might want to try to set something up in a particular layout. In this case, there's an area of this piping and instrumentation drawing that is circled here. And then up here, there is another circular viewport. So if I double click in here, I'm picking the things that are down here because that is a separate viewport. And the reason that you don't look through it and see all the things behind it in the main rectangular viewport is that I created an island. So this is what it looks like and then I'll show you how I did it. The viewport itself, the main viewport here, looks like this. And you can see that there's an island right there for that viewport. And the, the reason there's an island there is because when I made the viewport, let me unlock it. When I made the viewport, I made it from a region that had a circular island in it as a result of having something removed. And it's a little counterintuitive because what I did was I put an island in the um, region, but as a region, it's not an island, it's a hole. The rest of it is an object, and then the circle is a hole. But if you convert it into a, a viewport, that, that reverses. So that right there is the result of making a region out of a rectangle and a circle, and that leaves an island. And then what I did was made a circular viewport that was exactly the same size. And that circular viewport is right here. And then I put the circular viewport right on top of that little island. So this is simply a copy of this viewport right here. If I double click in this one and I go and highlight things, you can see they highlight over here and they highlight down there. This is a copy of the rectangular viewport and you can see again, if I get a few things here, they highlight in all the places that you can see those entities. So then with this, I just, after I made it, I moved it so that it lined right up so that the center of this, Remove this object right here, and that the center of that object lines right up with the center of this object. Now I've got a viewport inside a viewport, and you don't even have to worry about not being able to select it because it's not inside this viewport, it's sitting on an island in that viewport. So I can double click back and forth, and it actually allows me to go into one, then go into the other. Um, without having to go through the control R function of moving around in viewports. So let's just show you how to make the region. So I start with a rectangle. Um, the reason everything disappeared is, I believe, probably a video problem. There it is. We regenerate and it all comes back. All right, so if I draw a rectangle, and I put that rectangle right here, and I can do as many of these as I want. I could have circles. I could have an irregular P-line. So let's say I wanted to put some text on top. Put a P-line here like that. <clears throat> now the region command will convert all of these entities into regions. And now that they're regions, I can use the subtract command or the union command or the intersect command. And if I use the subtract command, I can say subtract from that rectangular region, those entities right there. Now I have a single entity that is essentially a thin piece of material with two circular and one irregular polyline holes in it. And that's so I can then extrude it and turn it into a 3D object. But if I go up to the layout tab, and I say, let's go and create from an object a new viewport. And I pick that viewport right there. Now I've got a viewport that has entities hidden by islands. The one little um, odd thing about this is that if I have object snap set, and I do have object snap set here, as I start drawing, and go over the islands, it'll actually snap to things behind the island itself. So if I'm drawing a line, you notice it's snapping to all those entities that are underneath. You just have to be aware of that. But if what you want is to go and say, gee, I want to put some text right here, you can now do anything you want in paper space, and it's not going to show up. It's not going to show up 
model space and you can annotate things. Yeah, that's it. So this next puzzler, those of you, well, everyone in this class who took CAD applications has seen this. In fact, it was a major project that you had to do in the CAD applications class. I'm going to include it here to remind you of some of the various things that were um, puzzling the person who brought it to my attention or asked me about it. So I've just now opened up a DXF file. The DXF file is a text file, we've looked at it before, that contains a description of the drawing and it's used to exchange drawing formats. This problem came from a city engineer who had uh, a problem because they had some GPS um, equipment, you know, satellite equipment for determining the location of various elements in the city of sewers and drains, etc. And that um, device, that, that equipment, made a DXF file consisting of all the points which were placed extremely accurately. And they were then going to bring the points in and put them on a, on a street center line. And so they opened up the DXF file that was created and, and and the engineer had no experience with AutoCAD. He had some other experience, but so he called and he said, "You know, we're supposed to have a DXF file, but I opened it up and it was empty." Now that's a common thing when people have not used AutoCAD before or other CAD programs. If I open up a file and I don't see anything, I assume it's empty. And I just said, "Well, do a zoom extents." And when he did a zoom extents, it turned out it wasn't empty. There was a lot of stuff in it. And then he said, "Oh my, well, it's apparently got everything we want in it." I assume that those are all points, that's what those are right there, and that they're accurate. But all the text that was entered to indicate what those points represented, the date and the time that they were captured, they're all so big that we can't read them except in a, it just happened to be there were two of them. For instance, if everything looked like this, this would be kind of a nightmare, although we can fix that too. But there were two that were sort of on, off by themselves, so it was pretty obvious what was going on here. So well, we need to be able to read that data, and um, we need to do it in such a way that we don't lose the, the accuracy of the points. So the first thing is DXF files, and actually that was the first question now that I think of it. How do you open a DXF file? And you just open it in AutoCAD, it just it does. Once you open a DXF file, um, he said, you know, I can't see anything. What do you do? You just do a zoom extents. And one, make sure that, you know, you have all your layers thought out if you do that. Um, and then do the zoom extents, he saw all these entities. And then, of course, it was, what do we do? And you notice, by the way, when I go to the layers, there's one layer here, and everything is on one layer. So the first thing, as far as management goes, you want to do is to modify the drawing so that the layers are used to separate different types of entities. At any rate, here's just a reminder for those of you that have maybe forgotten or it's been a while since you took this. The solution to this is a QSelect command, which is a fabulous command. Now there was forever a filter command in AutoCAD and it still exists. If you type the word filter at the command prompt, <clears throat> it allows you to go through and make a selection filter. And if you type negative filter at the command prompt, it uh, doesn't give you the command line version. All right, that surprised me. I thought it would be the command line version if we did a negative. Nope, it brings up a dialog box as well. The, pro the thing is that um, you can use the filter command function at the command line if you put it into a Lisp program. So Lisp itself has all sorts of filter tools, but QSelect is the way to go for those of you that are, that are, that are users. And we'll take a look, and when we deal with the Lisp unit in this class, we'll take a look at how to filter things out using Lisp as well. So I'm not going to select anything here, do a zoom extent. So what I'm going to do is go over to properties. And in the upper right hand corner, there's a Q select button or the quick select button. It used to look like a funnel. Now, it, I don't know, it's got a lightning bolt and a, I'm not sure why they think that icon looks like a filter icon, but they do. So I'm going to select it. I get the dialog box and I'm going to go and I'll be, be able to use this to make selections. Now, before I do, what I'm going to create is some new layers. So I'll go to the layer command and I'll say I want to uh, make a layer for dates. And I'll give that layer a certain color. Let's say the dates are all going to be in green. Um, and then I'll go back and I would make another layer for times, etc. Except what I would do is type negative LA and I would just say let's make new layers, N for new. And say you know, a layer called times and a layer called points. And I would have put the dates in here as well. 
then I could indicate that I want the color um, magenta. Oops. The color magenta to be apl applied to the um, times layer. And I can say I want the color blue to be applied to the points layer and leave it at that. So I can add layers from the command line and by doing that it allows me to understand the structure required to make layers either with a script which we'll look at next or a, um, a list program. So now that I've got those things I go back to properties and go up here to Q select and I'm just going to move things around. I'm going to put the points on a point layer. So I'm going to say go and get all the points in this drawing. Now you have to be careful because it's got a series of filters here. And when you pick an entity here, the property that is also being selected is color. So right now, it would pick all the points whose color equals by layer. But you can't assume that if somebody gives you a drawing that they use the same standard you do and that all the colors are by layer. People often change color of an entity itself. I think generally that's a bad idea, but people do it. So when you look at this, instead of saying we're going to get the point whose color equals some specific color, we're going to go to the equals and say select all, which gives us every point in the drawing no matter what the color is that it's set. I pick it and you can see that it highlights all the points. I go back to properties and it tells me there are 134 points in this drawing. This is just a part of the city itself and you know it's probably only a, maybe a maximum of 10% of the city. So you can imagine they've got a lot of data here and they want to make sure they can manage that data. Well, I'm going to now that it's highlighted, just go down and say, let's change the layer that those points are on. Let's put that on the points layer. One other thing I would point out, I would make the points layer a locked layer so that there's no danger that I move those points around inadvertently because you move one of those points and the purpose of this is completely shot. The idea is they spent a lot of money on the GPS data gathering equipment, so you want to make sure that there's no change in the accuracy by your inadvertently moving something. So now we go back here, and now what I want to do is make the text readable. So I'm going to go over, and I'm going to say let's get all the text in this drawing. Once again, I'm going to say select all. Even though in this drawing it's not necessary, I'm going to do it to make sure that I don't overlook anything. Now it is selected all the text but did not select the points. I go back to properties and I'm going to go down and I'm going to change the text height from 249 feet which is what it's set to because this this uh, whole DXF file is created in feet. And I'll change that to um, let's see what happens if I change it to 100. Readable or not? Looks like it is. Yeah so it gets it more readable well, let's make it even smaller. Let's make it 10. All right, so now I can still read that at 10. It's not the height I'd want to plot it at. In fact, I'd probably want to plot it at 0.1. But if I make it 0.1, it's a little hard to read. However, we got it. We can do that. Let's make it 0.1. So that's 0.1 is going to be the height that we want it to be. But before I do that, I want to say let's make all of it annotative. And in order to do that, what I want to do is make a new text style. Now I'm going to pick annotative as my text style. And now it's automatically going to apply a scale of 1 to 1. Now I'm going to go in there and I'm going to add a scale. Oh, not showing. All right, I'll do that in a minute then. What I want to do is add another scale to it so I have one that's readable. Because if I make that scale um, paper height 0.1, which is what I'd like it to be to plot, it's going to be extremely hard to see in this drawing because it's going to be so tiny. And yet, if I lay this out, I want that text to be at that height. Um, so let's... First, I'm going to have to go to style because I don't ever want annotative as the name of a text style because somebody could change that. And you notice right now it's based on TXT. So I'm going to rename annotative. I'm going to call it Roman S because I'm now going to go and I'm going to set the font that is that that style is based on to the Roman S SHX. And I'll set it as my current font. Okay, so now if I do zoom in on one of those pieces of text, you'll notice that it's based on the Roman S font and not the TXT font, the otherwise known as the ugly font. 
The other thing I need to do is go over here to scales, um, annotated scales, and I'm going to have to go to custom because right now this drawing is only listing architectural scales. I want it to list scales that we'd use in civil. And that would, you know, civil in the United States would be one inch equals 100 feet, one inch equals 1,000 feet. So the actual viewport scale I would use to accomplish that would be ratios, one to 100, one to 1,000, etc. So what I'm going to do is say, give me metric scales instead of architectural scales. And now I have one to 100 here, for instance. But I could also add other scales, which I'll have to do. So I could indicate that I'm going to have a scale of like one to 1,000. And it's going to have a ratio of 1 to 1,000. Pick OK. So now I've got that as my custom scale. Pick OK. The reason I needed that scale is I want to go back to Properties. And in Properties, I want to go back and select all the text. And select all. Oops, not less than. Select all. Now i got all the text again. I'm going to go back to Properties. I want to add to the one-to-one -one scale. I want to add, what do we use, one to a thousand? Now the beauty of that is, if I change the scale, the annotated scale, to one to a thousand now, now I can actually read all that text. And so it's just a little easier to see it. But I can also go back and say, no, I just want to see it at one-to-one, -one, and now it's going to look the actual size that it is. I think I'm going to add one more scale to that. In this case, I am going to add, okay, I'm getting all the text. Uh, in this case, what I'm going to go, do is go and add another annotative scale in about 1 to 100. So that I have three choices here as far as the visibility of the text goes. This is all you know, going to be determined when I go to my layouts as well. So now that I've added that, all I have to do in order to be able to read this is go over here, pick 1 to 100. Now it shows up at 1 to 100, and I think that's the one I want to use for actually manipulating this. So um, now I'm going to go back to Properties. When I go back to Properties, I'm going to put all the dates on the layer called Dates. And I'm going to do that by going to Q Select, and this time I'm going to get text, all the text whose contents, not equals, but matches a wildcard. Wildcards are left something from the DOS era. AutoCAD uses a number of them. The two most significant are the asterisk, which means everything, and the tilde, which means everything but. So right now, I'm going to say I want to get every piece of text whose contents match anything, an asterisk, a front slash, and an asterisk. And that should get me all the dates, which it does. And when it gets me all the dates, I can now say, let's put all those dates on the layer called dates. So now I've managed to put um, to reorganize the layers. I go back and now I'm going to get all the times. And so if I go to text, whose contents, wildcard match, and the times I'll have a colon, so asterisk, colon, asterisk. In other words, no matter what, if there's a colon in it, it's going to select it. So now I've got all the times. I go back to properties now, go to layer drop down, and I say put all the put those in all the times. So now you'll notice I've got times on one layer, dates on another layer, and they have multiple scales assigned to them. And then I have the points on their own layer, and the points are on their own layer, and it's it's kind of grayed out or faded out because that's a locked layer. So if I tried to move one of those, it would say no, you can't do that. It's on a locked layer. Now after this I can manipulate things. I'll just go one more step on this and then we'll, we'll stop on this one. The idea here is what you can do in QSelect. And I'm just scratching the surface because you could say, for instance, I want to go and get all the text in the drawing that's larger than 0.1 but smaller than 0.2 and then change the height of the text so that it's all consistent. Um, there's a tremendous amount of control you have using QSelect which will save you an enormous amount of time and it's a great tool for cleaning up a drawing you get from somebody else that was not drawing drawn very well. Um, what I want to do now is let's move all the times. So um, I'm using just those two points. Actually, I'm going to just use that one point right there to do that. <clears throat> I want all the times to be up underneath each other so that when I plot it, I can actually see them. 
I mean, I'll use, at this point, I'll just use that scale that it's set for now. So I'm going to go back to properties. And under properties, I'm going to go over, and this time I'm just going to say get everything who's, that's on the layer called date. So it'll pick all the dates. Now they're all selected, so I'm going to say let's move from the insertion point of this, and I'm going to move it up here so it goes directly underneath the word sewer. And I'm going to track directly up like that. Now I would want these to be in a specific location, um, but I could put something in that location or I could just move that here. Now that just moved all the dates in the entire drawing. Now I'd go back and do the same thing for the times. Again, you can go ahead and get everything that's on a specific layer. And now that I put everything on the right layers, it's easily done. Once you've got all of these selected, as long as noun verb selection is identified on the pick first function. Now I can say let's move from the insertion point of that. And again, we'll just move it so it just goes straight up and goes under here. Now no matter where we go in this drawing, we'll be able to see what that point is and what date it was and what time it was put in there. By the way, you see when this happened was 2003, so this was uh, it's just a really good example of how to use QSelect. So we're done with that. This next one is to demonstrate why I insist that you never use the name standard, annotative, or the dimension style uh, name for uh, metric dimensions that comes up. So let me just point that out. I'm going to make a new drawing that is um, a metric drawing. If I go to dimension styles, it has three predefined styles. Never use these names for anything. And the reason is because drawings are usually or often combined with other drawings. And off, in fact, a drawing is often used as an external reference in multiple other drawings. And then people sometimes bind those external references to the, to the host drawing or drawings that sometimes inserted. The point I'm making is that every AutoCAD drawing that was started with metrics started with all three of those names. If you use one of those names and redefine a dimension style, at some point, if you ever want to combine two drawings and they both have dimension styles called ISO 25, the host drawing is going to be the one that uses its settings. And that means you could have something change fairly dramatically. And I'm going to demonstrate that. The point I'm making right here, though, is if I'm going to create a dimension style here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to set one current. I'm going to then delete the ones I don't want. And in this case, it's going to be the ISO 25 and standard. I would do the same thing for text if I could, but the text style standard cannot be deleted because it's used by Autodesk. Then I would rename annotative and give it some other name. Arc metric, for instance, if that's what it was. And then I'd go from there. Now here's why. What I'm going to do is open up a drawing. So this drawing is a host drawing into which another drawing was externally referenced. This is the external reference drawing. If I come over here to the external references palette, the drawing I'm in currently, the host is named 24. Happens to be the number of these puzzlers. The uh, drawing that was externally referenced in is called Dimension Demo Guest. And I'm using this as an illustration of why you want to avoid using the name standard, annotative, or ISO 25 for anything that you want to redefine, or actually for anything. So that when you have a, an external reference like this and it comes in, it may be true that it looks fine as an external reference. And if we open up that external reference drawing, you'll see that it looks the same here. It has a dimension style called standard with one child variation called linear. Now, this is an older drawing. And I believe, I probably this drawing was done before there were annotative objects. Otherwise, that would be an annotative dimension style. But anyway, this is a dimension style called standard. But major changes were made to the definition of standard as it exists when you first started drawing. The drawing was then saved and then used as an external reference. And the external reference, if you look at dimension styles, you'll notice there's one style in this external reference, also called standard, doesn't have any linear variations, but this is the default standard setting, which is the ugly font, and it is uh, decimal as opposed to architectural. It's just not the way you've defined yours. 
although your linear dimensions will probably stay the same. We're going to see. So the problem comes when you decide that the external reference should become part, a permanent part, of the host drawing. So if you go over here to external references and right click, you can bind that drawing, which means it's as though you inserted it as opposed to externally referenced it. There are two different bind types. One is a bind type of bind and one is an insert type of bind. If you think, well, yeah, I wish I'd inserted it. I'm just going to go here. All of a sudden, everything changes here and it changes because, and some of it, let me see if I can find a dimension that's not linear. Well, you can see for one thing, all the text changed to, to the TXT font. Um, the font itself doesn't look very good. It's still architectural as opposed to mechanical, but that's because you had a linear variation for child uh, dimensions. Now I'm going to back up. I'm going to go back to the point where I haven't bound it yet. I'm going to go and bind it again, and this time instead of using an insert type of bind, I'm going to use a bind type of bind. Now it comes in as though it's been inserted, but the dimension style itself doesn't change. If I go and look at dimension styles now, I've got one called Dimension Demo Guest dollar sign zero dollar sign standard and under it one called linear. And that is a child variation of this. So I have two different dimension styles here. <clears throat> There's no conflict between the two names because the name standard wasn't used for the one that came as an XREF. Standard was, um, the name standard had appended to it the name of the drawing, a zero um, bracketed by two dollar signs, which is just an increment. Conceivable, you could have a zero, I mean a dollar sign, one dollar sign, not very likely. Now, what do I do with that? If I go to the rename command, turns out that every element of this drawing, when I did a bind type of bind, was not simply named what it was named in the original drawing, it was named that and appended to it was the prefix of the drawing name, a dollar sign, a zero, and a dollar sign. I can go in, for instance, let me bring my magnifier up so you can see what I'm doing a little better. You can see Def Points was the only layer um, that was in this particular drawing other than layer zero, which you cannot rename. That's why it doesn't show up here. So if I decide I want to get rid of that dimension demo guest right there, I can select it. Oh, just one. I can select it, go down here, and under old name, I can say, let's take that and anything that has that prefix assigned to it and ends in anything. That's a wild card. That's a DOS wild card. We saw that a little earlier. Asterisk means anything. If I say, let's rename that to anything, it'll eliminate all of that and then leave me with just what follows. So if I then pick rename two and then take a look, I've now cleaned up this whole naming convention. So now all I have is my actual layer name. In the dimension styles, I have to be a little bit careful when I do that here. Here, I'm gonna say, well, let's take this right there and let's call that um, instead of what we're calling it here, let's call it arc demo. So now I do a rename and it renames just that one style, which means I've got arc demo, but then I've got this down here. Well, I want, and suppose I had additional child variations. This, by the way, yeah, this might be a little confusing. Dollar sign zero is being used in two different ways here. Over here, this is what is added to any element of a bound external reference to make the name distinct from the same name in any uh, existing host drawing. So the dollar sign zero dollar sign here has to do with having it been bound. This dollar sign zero has to do with it being a child variation of another dimension style. What we want is everything up to dollar sign zero. We want all of that to be replaced with arc demo. That way this will be seen as a child variation of that parent style. So I'm going to go here. And again, I could have two or three other things here as well. And I'm coming down to the old name, and I'm going to change that. Anything having to do with this, I mean, anything that has that in the um, name, is going to be replaced with arc demo asterisk. Now, in other words, this part right here going to be replaced with arc demo and then anything that comes after standard is going to be placed after arc demo. 
what we're going to end up with is arc demo dollar sign zero. Come over here and pick rename. Come up here and look, and that's exactly what we have. Now that's the parent style, that's the child style. So we come back out, go back to dimension styles, and under the dimension style, you'll notice we have arc demo and then linear as the um, zero dollar sign zero. So that becomes now the uh, dimension style that defines everything that was in the in the original external reference. So for this presentation, I have one more puzzler. There are a number of additional ones uh, identified in the textbook, and I'm going to give you, as an assignment, a group of puzzling behaviors and ask you to solve them. Uh, indicate to me in a document what it is that you had to do to solve them, and then submit whatever files uh, you used to uh, do that uh, that have been corrected. So I'm going to give you a group of files, and I'm going to tell you there's some problems with it, and I'm going to have you solve them. They won't be the same puzzlers, but the techniques for approaching them are going to be the same as the one you, ones you've just seen. So the last one is brand new. It comes in the 2021 version of AutoCAD. But before I illustrate it, what I want to do is to put my defaults for the AutoCAD installation that I'm working in right now back to what they were. So I'm going to go over to the Start button in Windows. I'm going to scroll down to AutoCAD English. We saw this earlier. I'm doing it now because I want things to start over so you can see what happens when you first start it up because that's where the puzzle starts. I will say, <clears throat> well, I'll give you more information about that as we go, but reset settings to default allows me to go through and say, let's reset our custom settings. And I'm going right back to the originals. Now it's going to go through and it's going to start AutoCAD and it's going to look like it does when you first uh, install it. And what I'm looking at here is the, the Visual Lisp editor that has been part of AutoCAD for many releases. Um, it, is, it is a really effective, it's what we'll be using when we start doing a Lisp programming section. That Visible Lisp, uh, Lisp editor now has an alternative that was added in this release. And that alternative is used in Microsoft, well, you'll see in just a minute. V, v Lisp is the name of the of the alias for starting the VLIDE command, the Visual Lisp um, development environment. You enter it now, and the first thing you get is select what you want. And you can either select Microsoft Visual Studio Code, the AutoCAD Auto Lisp ex, uh, extension, or AutoCAD's Visual Lisp editor. I always try out anything new in AutoCAD when it comes out. And in fact, the first thing I do is install it, go through a series of drawings, take a look at all the things that are new, see if I can figure out how it behaves and whether it's worth doing. So, of course, I downloaded this. Turns out, for me, that was a mistake. As a result of downloading that, I ended up with a, a problem, which is that every time I tried to insert a block, um, once I've downloaded that and tried using it, I got an unhandled exception error. And I have gone through and corrected that error. And in fact, earlier in this series, earlier in this presentation, I showed you the problems I was having. Um, and the solution to fix it was to finally go here. Well, after I did that, I reset everything and I went and tried again to download the Visual Studio Code and the AutoCAD Auto Lisp extension to see if I could work with them. And once again, it ended up causing a problem with the block palette. That problem is not common just to me. I mean, it's not just mine. It's a, It's been a fairly common problem. What I'm going to tell you is I, I see no reason, unless you're a really serious programmer and you absolutely have to have the um, Visual Studio Code, I see no reason why you wouldn't select that. Now, when I select it, there's a variable called Lisp Sys that gets changed from 1 to 0. 1 is the default now instead of 0. I think that Autodesk would have been better off if they'd left VLISP as a default and then given you the option of adding this if you wanted it, because I think a lot of people will probably say, oh, that must be better. It is not, unless you're a serious programmer. It's actually more confusing to use, in my opinion. Um, but it also, for me, has caused this quite serious problem that uh, I can't use the insertion block palette. So I'm going to stop AutoCAD. And I'm going to restart it because when you change that variable, you have to restart the software in order for it to take effect. And I'm going to see what happens now that I've redone back the defaults. If I never install Microsoft 
Studio Code if I'm going to be able to use the yes and I am so now when I type I instead of getting unhandled exception error I am getting this and I'm going to try using it to see what happens now VLisp is going to bring up the Visual Lisp editor and that's the one we're going to be using in this class and that's the one I highly recommend that you use um, I'm going to talk to Paul Richardson who's my colleague in the department who is a serious programmer and ask him to take a look at that and see if he has the same problems I do and see if from his point of view there's any advantage to using the Microsoft Visual Code but for us this is going to be the easiest way to go and I'm hoping that it'll prevent the problem with that palette just to show you how this works this is where you can go in and start a new file and write some code I'm going to use my magnifier so you can see what I'm doing a little bit better so I'm going to do a very simple list program. I'm going to first put a note in here, and the note's going to be demo list program. And that note has nothing to do with the program itself. It's just a note to myself. List programs all start with an open parenthesis, and that's how they are um, labeled um, by some people who don't like list programming. They call it LASP, lost in stupid parentheses. Parentheses to me make a lot of sense, it's sort of similar to using parentheses in mathematical calculations where every open parenthesis needs a closed parenthesis and you make things in chunks essentially in a very sequential list. So what I'm going to do is to define a new function and that function will op operate as an AutoCAD command and I'm going to give the name OO which to me makes sense because it's my object snap command and I'm going to go and say set the variable osmode, which is a variable like the other variables we've been seeing in this uh, in this demo. We didn't look at that one, but it stands for osnap mode or object snap mode. And it allows you to set a value that will determine what your running osnaps are. Now, if I want to know first what that value should be, if I go over to AutoCAD, I mean, I'm just going to dock that on the right get it out of the way. If I go over to AutoCAD and I go down to my object snap settings and I say well what I want is endpoint. I like midpoint so I'm going to put that in there as well. Center, intersection, extension. I like apparent intersection actually. I'm going to put that in as well. So that's what I would like to have as my running object snaps. Now we need to because I just redid the defaults my command line is now floating. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to type Osmode and it's going to tell me that the current setting is 6183. That value determines what my running object snaps are. This is something called bitsum um, a, uh, identification where each of those object snaps has a number of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. We're going to talk about that later as well. All I care about right now is 6183. I go back to the Visual List Programmer. In the Visual List Programmer, I'm going to type 6183 as the value for Osmo that I want whenever I want to go back to my personal defaults. Close the program up with that close parenthesis. Now, that parenthesis closes the opening parenthesis, and you'll notice that every opening parenthesis has a closing parenthesis that matches it. And if it didn't, this program wouldn't work. We'd get an error. So that line right there goes all the way to that closing parenthesis. This just an empty little area, but um, we'll talk about that when we do the list thing. So that's, that's actually a program, and that is going to give me a new command called OO, which did not exist before. I'm going to load that into this current drawing. Now I'm going to go back and go back down here. I'm going to change my running object snaps. I'm going to change my running object snaps by going, well, I'm going to go clear all of them. So I'm going to go up to this dialog box, clear all of them so there are no running object snaps right now. Get out of the magnifier so that it's not annoying you. Okay, here's my floating command line, which as you know, I don't like. In fact, I'm going to drag it down here, make it a little bigger so you can see what I'm doing. And then I'll put it back at the top where I think it belongs. Okay, now, so if I'm drawing lines right now, and I'm saying I draw a line here, draw a line there, draw a line here. If I then want to put a circle at the end of that line, I don't have any running object snaps. If I type OO, 
enter, now I want to put a circle at the end of that line, I have an endpoint as a running object snap. I also have midpoint as a running object snap. I also have center as a running object snap. And the reason for that is because the osmode variable reset my running object snaps to what I had when I started. So the visual list editor is what we're going to be using. The puzzler is what do you do when you first install it. And I am going to go over this um, with you as a group. Um, well, I'll put a little, I'll put something on Brightspace to explain when you do, do download and install this software, what you have to do when you, when you first use VLIS. And that's what we're going to be using for the rest of the semester. That's it for puzzlers, and um, our next unit, I'll put another video together. There'll be a series of these videos, one per lecture, that you'll be required to watch. And then again, I'm going to have some Zoom settings, uh, some Zoom uh, sessions set up so that people can come in and ask questions if you want. You'll also have some discussion assignments where you have to get together with other people and discuss some of the assignments. But anyway, that's it for this uh, lecture, too.